Right, so I think everybody has joined us. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to today's 4-H Quarantine Virtual Science Cafe. I'm Alice Philbrick, 4-H Community Science Education Assistant, and I'm really glad that you guys could all join us today. 4-H is a community for all kids with programs that suit a variety of backgrounds, interests, budgets, and schedules. From in-school to after-school, clubs to camps, 4-H's positive youth development programs are available in your local community and welcome every kid who wants to have fun, learn, and grow. 4-H is the youth development program of the University of Maine, brought to you by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. <clears throat> so I hope you have all had a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box. If you haven't yet, um, please feel free to do that now. Just your first name in your town. Um, with us from Maine 4 H today, I also have Caitlin Doloff. She's monitoring the chat with us today. And Jesse Brainerd will be handling our Q&A. We're going to keep it pretty simple today. Our guest will share some of his cool research and a bit about himself. We will have plenty of time for you to ask questions. We do ask that you use that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and Jesse will get those presenters or get those questions to our presenter. Um, a quick reminder for you, we can't see you or hear you, but we do ask that you respond to the polls as much as, as, much as you can, submit your questions through the Q&A box and make sure that you share your reactions and thoughts with us through the chat box. One quick note about chat, we'd love to see your reactions to what our guest is presenting, but please be sure to keep your messages on topic and keep that language clean and appropriate or we will have to turn off that feature and we really don't want to do that. So it's my pleasure um, to introduce Tom Roundsville. Tom is a molecular diagnostic professional with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Uh, Tom, we're so excited that you're here with us today. Will you please tell our participants more about yourself and your work? All right, thank you very much for that introduction. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. All right. One second. Okay, can everyone see it all right? I guess you can't really respond. Looks good. Okay. All right, so um, I'm gonna be talking about wildlife forensics uh, today. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself um, just to give you an introduction about uh, me and what I do, and then sort of talk about wildlife forensics, um, which is a topic that I have experience in, but I don't currently work with it at the moment um, yet is what I would say. So we'll see what happens in the future. Um, so uh, I am the molecular diagnostic professional with the Humane Cooperative Extension. Um, so I work at the new diagnostic and research lab based in Orono. There's a picture of our building here. Um, so we have a, a nice building. It's very close to UMaine Orono's campus, um, but it's located off campus. Um, just a picture of uh, what the building looks like. I know the slide says it's a little bit about me, um, but I'm not actually in this picture. Um, that's Dr. Allison Smart working in her lab. Uh, but jokingly, I can say if you look in the very far right of the picture, um, that's a window looking into my office and me sitting at the computer. I didn't realize that this picture existed until pretty recently, so I had a good laugh when I saw myself on it. Um, but this laboratory uh, allows us to work on a lot of different things. Um, in my current position, though, uh, I use molecular biology methods, so DNA and genetics, uh, to test ticks for disease-causing organisms like Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, babesiosis. Um, things that uh, are very of interest uh, to the public health in Maine. Um, and people can submit ticks to the lab for testing um, through our website. Um, also, I use these same tools to investigate uh, plant disease um, and issues related to animal health, um, since we have a veterinary lab um, and a plant diagnostic lab here as well in the building. Um, so it's uh, a little bit of everything uh, of whatever comes through the door. Um, at that moment I get to work on. So how did I actually get to where I am now? Um, well, first things first, I want to say that when I was younger, um, I knew I really just wanted to study animals. Um, I would love going outside and looking at uh, nature and just watching animals just do normal uh, activities in their lives. I was really fascinated by how many different kinds of animals there were and just all their different functions and the way uh, that they lived. Um, so when I was smaller, I used to keep a, a journal of observations of uh, some pet fish that I have. I used to just 
sit there and stare at the tank with a notebook and just watch them when they would, you know, decide to go to the surface and eat and their interactions with each other. Um, you know, most kids would probably find it really boring to stare at a bunch of fish for you know, hours on end, but I really just love doing it. Um, and I also would study uh, my pet cat and dog and pretend that they were wildlife subjects that I was trying to learn more about. Um, so one thing I will say though, is that, um, you know, nowadays uh, citizen science or uh, scientific projects that incorporate the use of citizens or people like you um, to actually help collect the data uh, wasn't really available then, but it is now. So if this is uh, something that seems really interesting to you. There's always uh, people out there looking for uh, more eyes to go see what types of animals, maybe birds or mammals might be seen in certain places. So I highly encourage um, you to look into that if uh, that's something that you're interested in. So a little bit more about my schooling. Um, in high school, I really liked biology, uh, but I also took a forensic science class my senior year of high school, which I was really lucky to actually have this as an option to take. Um, and, uh, you know, you might think now uh, that I'm a molecular biologist that I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do um, when I was younger, but in reality, I didn't have much interest in that. It wasn't actually till my senior year of college um, till I started using molecular biology. So it's pretty late in the game. Uh, but once I started using those techniques to research wildlife, um, I just got hooked and, you know, I, I never really got out of it. So just to go really quickly, um, I graduated high school in 2006 and I did take a number of science courses. And it's great to just take a variety of different things so you can sort of uh, get an idea of what you really want to do or what you're interested in. But it's plenty fine to have no idea, um, you know, at that point that you want to go into one particular career or another. Because um, you might plan uh, to do one thing and life will take you in another one. And I'm sure you'll hear that a lot from many different people. Um, so in 2010, I had received a BS in biology from Houghton College. Um, and like I'd said, I discovered molecular biology pretty late in my senior year. Um, in 2012, I got a master of science degree um, in biology where I studied coyotes at East Stroudsburg University. Um, and this is where I was first uh, exposed to doing wildlife forensics work. I really had no plan on doing this. Uh, one day my supervisor who was uh, working, doing forensics work just said, hey, do you wanna try this? And I said, yes. And you know, sure enough, I ended up completing about 50 to 70 cases on my own. Um, so most recently I received a PhD in wildlife and fisheries resources management um, from West Virginia University. Um, I did do more forensics work there as well, um, but I studied bobcats, um, which was really neat. And maybe in the future, I'll give a presentation on that as well. We'll see. All right, now that I've talked about myself enough, um, I wanna talk about the topic at hand, uh, which is wildlife forensics. So great question, what actually is wildlife forensics? Well, it's the application of forensic science to solve crimes involving wildlife. You know, it doesn't sound uh, too complicated, but just to put it in perspective, um, in terms of the global scale, the uh, most lucrative crime in terms of money, making money for the, the criminals, um, the first three are drugs, human trafficking, and illegal weapon sales. And the fourth is wildlife tracking and crimes against wildlife. Now, it seems kind of strange to think that uh, crimes involving wildlife would be that profitable. But in reality, um, about 7 to $23 billion a year um, is made illegally with uh, trading these animals um, and different parts of the world. So the first thing a lot of people think of when they think of wildlife crime or crimes against wildlife is usually thinking about uh, people poaching uh, ivory from African elephants and then selling it, you know, to collectors uh, illegally in different markets around the world. Um, but really important thing that I want to drive home is that wildlife trafficking or crimes against wildlife aren't really a problem just for charismatic African megafauna. And that's just a really, uh, you know, interesting way to say cool, big animals. So it's something that happens in the United States very frequently and happens, you know, even in Maine uh, quite a bit. So here is uh, just a snippet from a Facebook post um, from about two years ago. Um, this was a post from the uh, Maine Warden Service asking uh, the general public if they knew anything about this uh, deer that was killed. Um, I believe it was uh, a deer that was killed with a firearm during archery season and then just sort of left to die. And I'm not really going to debate the merits of, you know, the politics and other things about hunting um, in this presentation. 
Um, but if you are actually a hunter, that is, you know, a very nice deer there that someone killed for no reason. Um, so this is definitely something that happens locally. It's not just an issue um, in, you know, foreign localities. So why is this actually important? Well, we need laws to conserve wildlife. Um, you know, generally speaking, the public is very interested in conserving wildlife and making sure that it's available for future generations, but not everyone thinks the same way. So we actually need these laws to make sure that these uh, species are conserved. So if we didn't have these laws, others would, you know, exploit the animals. And if you really want an example of this, you really just need to look back in history. Um, so this here, every time I see it, I'm shocked uh, by it. Um, but what that actually is, is a picture from 1892, and that is a pile of bison skulls, so the American bison. Um, those are skulls that were piled up being used to make fertilizer. So just to put it in perspective, the American bison um, was overhunted from about 60 million uh, animals down to a few hundred individuals by the late 1800s. Um, so this is what happens if there are no laws, no regulation, is that certain people um, that will do what they want to do to, you know, make money or improve their own lot will gladly exploit wildlife. So we definitely need these laws to protect the animals. Okay, so now that I introduced the topic, um, it's a very diverse subject. Um, we could talk about things like forensic pathology, so that's uh, studying what might be causing disease. So it could be, you know, uh, poisons, certain chemicals, uh, it could be things like lead. Um, we could study forensic entomology, um, and that's looking at insects and their role in animals and their decomposition um, and giving information on how uh, things may have happened. We could study forensic odontology, which is the study of bite marks and teeth, um, or we can study uh, forensic biological evidence analysis, which is what I'm actually going to talk about. Um, and this is something that's really near and dear to me. Uh, but there's a lot of different parts of a forensics lab that we could actually talk about. Um, but I'm going to stick to this in particular. So uh, at this point, instead of, um, you know, talking about all the different cases that I've done um, and all of the uh, different um, work that I've done, I think instead I'd rather uh, present a an idea of what it would actually be like to be a wildlife forensic scientist. So to give um, you an idea of what it would like to actually be to run your own case or work in uh, a similar setting to me. So what we're gonna do is proceed with an activity. There's going to be uh, times when I'm gonna ask questions. So I wanna get opinions and responses and different things. And as we go through it, um, we're just gonna try to work through and solve our own forensics case. So hopefully, um, it'll go well and we will solve the case. Okay, so when we're talking about biological evidence analysis, there's two really important questions that as a scientist, I would get asked um, by someone, uh, say from the main warden service um, in the field. Uh, the first is what species is it? And the second is, are these two or more parts from the same animal? I'm gonna explain more about these questions more, but, uh, these are definitely the most important things that I will be asked. So what species is it? Why is it important? Well, the real answer is that laws protecting species vary greatly. So for instance, let's take the bald eagle for example here. Um, it's protected by a number of federal laws, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the Lacey Act, and the more recent Eagle Act. Um, even though eagles aren't any longer on uh, the endangered species list, it is still, um, you still need a federal permit to hunt, trap, kill, or possess eagle parts. So this species here has a lot of laws and it is protected. So we're gonna compare that to the coyote. Uh, the coyote is afforded no federal protection. Uh, Maine has an open hunting season with no bag limits. Um, so this species really isn't protected at all. In terms of science, they're really interesting uh, because they aren't originally from Maine. Uh, but they sort of moved here uh, as humans pushed out other larger predators like wolves. And I don't really have time to talk about that now, um, but because they are sort of a newer member in these ecosystems, uh, there's a lot less protections for them since they don't really have a historic part in that. So just to reiterate, um, certain species have more protections than others, and those laws are important. Okay, so now we're gonna start our first activity. 
Um, and the real question of this is going to be, should we charge the suspect? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a really cool video to show or anything, so we're going to play imagination time here. Um, so I'm going to try to explain a scenario and a story, and uh, we'll see how we go from there. So um, we're going to imagine ourselves as being a combination individual. We're going to be a member of the main warden service, and at the same time, we're also going to be working in a wildlife forensics laboratory. Um, okay, so we imagine that we're sitting in our office and we get a phone call um, and we answer the phone and the person on the other end uh, tells us that while they were out hiking along the shoreline, um, they saw a number of dead bald eagles just sort of washing up in the surf. Um, when they were looking at them, they couldn't really see what happened. Um, they just know that there were a number of bald eagles uh, at this one area just sort of dead. Um, so they were very concerned that, you know, maybe these animals were poisoned, maybe someone was hurting them, they didn't really know. Um, so they wanted uh, someone to come down and take a look and see what was happening. Uh, so what you do then as a member of the warden service is you're going to get in your car and drive to that location and, uh, you know, get a better idea of why, why these eagles, um, you know, were found dead in the surf. So uh, you arrive on the scene, uh, but as you pull into a parking area um, to this location, uh, you witness someone arriving back to their vehicle uh, with a compound bow and holding uh, visibly bloody arrows. Um, when they get back, they proceed to quickly stash their equipment in their truck. Um, and when you walk up to them, uh, they seem really nervous because they recognize your uniform, um, which makes you think that something, you know, might be off with this person. So, you know, just to sort of get some information, you ask to see their hunting license, which they then give you. Um, so then you record their personal information in your notebook just in case you need to do an investigation later. Because remember, you're here looking for, you know, what might be causing uh, these eagles to have been killed. Um, so when you're going over their information, you just ask them about how their hunt was because um, you notice that they had freshly bloody arrows, but they weren't carrying an animal carcass out and they didn't have one in their vehicle. Um, so the person just seemed really nervous and then they responded uh, that they were just hunting coyotes. Um, then you ask them some more questions, but they, you know, kind of dodge what you're asking them and seem kind of nervous and then ask if it's okay for them to leave. So, as I said, uh, I was just hunting coyotes. So now we're going to open up our first question here. And can you charge the suspect with a crime? So we're just going to take a, a moment here um, to let everyone respond. And once we get the answers, then... Um, you know, if you want to type why you think yes or no, you can go ahead in the uh, question box and go ahead and do that in the Q&A. So we'll just take, uh, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. Tom, are you able to see the answers as they come in? Um, I just see the poll box up at the moment. Okay. Looks like we're waiting for a couple more votes and I'll end the poll in another couple seconds. Okay. 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 Wow. Look at that. Eight people say no. Did anyone respond in the Q&A box? Not for that one. Nope. Not yet. Okay. Anyone care to say why not? And you can type your response in the Q&A box or in the chat. I've got both open right here and I'll read out your responses for Tom. Oops. Oh, it looks like we have um, we have a couple of different responses and they're both pretty much the same. One person said, you have no proof that they killed the eagles. And another says, because you don't have evidence. Okay, well, those are great assessments. Um, and that's exactly what I would say. You know, while they're acting very suspicious and they may have done something, they really could just be hunting coyotes. So you really can't know. Um, so at that point, then, uh, you know, you just say it's okay for them to leave. Um, and then uh, as they're backing out their truck um, and they pull away, you realize that one of the bloody arrows that they had uh, been carrying before that you saw had actually fallen on the ground uh, beneath their car. 
So as they were leaving, um, you bend down and pick up the arrow and realize that it has blood on it. And now you have evidence that you can use in your investigation at the Wildlife Forensics Laboratory. So what can we do with this? So we collected that evidence. Um, it's the arrow with the biological material. Um, so if we were to get an arrow at the laboratory, um, there's multiple ways that you can look at it to collect um, some material you can use in your analysis. Um, underneath the actual broadhead itself where it screws into the arrow shaft. Um, when you take that out, some of the tissue of uh, an animal, if it was fired into them, will actually be stuck in there, which you can use um, then for genetic material. Um, or in this case, the arrow shaft itself would be coated in blood. Um, on the right, you can see uh, the fletchings, the uh, green parts of the arrow that stabilize it in flight have some uh, blood stain on that. All right, so now we've collected some biological material. Um, so what do we do with that? Well, we're going to do DNA analysis, and this is a really complicated topic. Um, you know, you'd spend multiple years in college learning about exactly how this works, and I'm going to try to sum it up in five minutes, so we'll see how we do. Um, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, some people call it genetic material, um, and these are the instructions of how to make a plant, animal, fungus, etc. Um, DNA is conserved across species, which is pretty neat um, that, you know, the same instructions are in bacteria, animals, plants, etc. Um, DNA is usually viewed in the double helix, which you see on the right of the page here. Generally speaking, uh, it's made up of four dinucleotide triphosphates. Uh, we abbreviate that DNTPs. Um, they are adenine, which we abbreviate with an A, thymine, which is a T, cytosine, which is a C, and guanine, which is a G. So overall in your body, um, you have about well, in each cell of your body, you have about 3 billion ACs, Ts, and Gs that have the entire instructions of how to make you. Um, kind of like I just said, your complete genetic code is found in virtually every cell of your body. So every single cell has all the information to make another you, which is pretty interesting. So the order of the ACs, Ts, and Gs um, is unique for each individual, um, except for identical twins. Um, and they'll have the, the same genetic code. Um, uh, while similar species have similar DNA sequences, others don't. So for instance, eagles are going to share more DNA sequences with other birds, things like birds have feathers and wings, those are more similar um, than mammals like coyotes. So what we would think is if we ran a DNA sequence analysis that the eagle DNA would be more similar um, to other eagles than it would be to mammals. So now what? All right, uh, this is what's called an electropharogram. I wanted to give you an idea of what it actually looks like when you produce a DNA sequence. Um, you'll notice here that there is a number of very colorful peaks going across the screen. Um, each peak, uh, different color, it stands for a different base. So if you look from one of the peaks up to the top of the, the screen, you'll see a series of ACs, Ts, and Gs. And that's just indicating what the sequence is uh, as it comes across to me. So this is what I would get out of my DNA sequencer when I run a sample. Um, and then what we actually do from that is create a sequence alignment. So here's the sequence alignment that we've created. So we took the material from the arrow um, and we ran that for this analysis. We also have a DNA from a known eagle um, that we had at the laboratory. And we also have DNA from a known coyote sample that we had in the laboratory. So if I were generating these sequences uh, for these two different DNA fragments, I would sit down and take a look at them um, and try to determine whether or not the sample from the arrow is more similar genetically to the eagle sample or the coyote sample and then sort of go from there. So at this point, what I wanna do is provide, uh, you know, not that much more information because I kind of want to see how you want to decipher this. Um, so at this point, I kind of want to ask the question of, can we then charge the suspect for hunting eagles? And now to make this easier for um, everyone to, to go through the analysis, um, I added some line bars here so you can see, uh, you know, which ones are separate to make the comparisons. So what I'd like you to do is take you know, a minute or two and go through and count up how many differences there are between the arrow and the eagle sequence and the arrow and the coyote sequence, and then go ahead and answer whether or not you would charge the suspect for hunting eagles. And at any time too, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box, um, or if you want to share an opinion, you can also do that.
And now at this point, I wish I could cue Jeopardy music or something. I should look into getting some music for poll questions. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're about 80% responded right now. Okay. I'll give it about 10 more seconds. And like Tom said, if anybody wants to explain why they chose the option they did in either the Q&A or the chat, I can read those out for everyone. All right, well, we have our responses in. Overwhelmingly, it looks like yes is the answer. I think I have the next slide was to look at the poll. Yep, okay, um, so just to go over, um, oops, what we have here, um, the easiest way to look at similarities and differences would be to uh, just change the color. Um, so as you go across the sequence for each individual going across the row, um, you can count up the differences between that row and any other row. Um, so here in green, I've highlighted the differences between the arrow sequence and the eagle sequence, and in red, the ones between the arrow and the coyote sequence. So if we go through and count them all up, we've discovered that there are a total of two differences between the arrow and the eagle sequence and nine differences between the arrow and the coyote. Um, and like I had said previously, Unless it's identical twins, no two individuals would have the same DNA. So this reference eagle that we have um, in our collection and then the arrow sample itself would have different DNA, even if, um, you know, they were the same species. So uh, like you correctly assessed, the DNA sequence from that arrow more cl closely matches that with the bald eagle. Um, so this, we can definitely charge the suspect with hunting eagles um, and have evidence to prove that they did, um, since we have an arrow that was in their possession with the biological material on it from an eagle. And we did, in the Q&A, we had someone who explained the reason they chose yes was because the blood on the arrow is closer to the blood of an eagle than the blood of a coyote. Correct. That's a great assessment. So now we're gonna ask another question. So can we then charge the suspect with killing the eagles that were found dead and floating in the ocean? So again, a yes or no question. And if you have an answer as to why, um, please share it in the Q&A box. I'm not sure if we have a poll for this one. So if any, everybody wants to just type yes or no in the chat box, that would be great. Anyone else care to answer? We only have um, one. I I did get um, one yes in the Q&A and, and they said because you have enough evidence and then we've got uh, two no's and two yeses in the chat box so far. One of the no's is because the eagles in the ocean might have been from somewhere else and the other is because you don't know if those were the eagles that were killed. Okay, well at this point uh the best way to put it is that you have very strong suspicions that those are the eagles that were killed that were floating in the ocean were the ones that were killed by this individual. Um, but unfortunately, you don't actually have enough evidence to prove it. So at this point, we're going to do some additional analysis um, to figure that out. So now we're going to answer that second important question um, that I brought up at the beginning, which was, are these two or more animal or two or more parts from the same animal? Um, this is a really important question for us to be able to answer. 
So we're going to use DNA fingerprinting, um, microsatellite genotyping. It's the method that this is called. Um, was developed in the 1980s and 90s as a way to genetically tell apart individuals. Um, this is the same technique that's used in a wildlife lab as would be used in a human crime lab. Um, we're just applying it to wildlife instead of people. Um, unlike what you might see on TV on a crime show when someone you know, grabs a swab off of something and then five minutes later they appear with a DNA match or something like that. Um, you know, finishing a DNA test will take days, not minutes, um, because there's a lot of very careful steps that you need to do. And depending on what material you have to work with, um, it can be a lot harder and might even take weeks or more. And I'm speaking from a lot of personal experience with that. So now we're going to dive into probably the most uh, scientific part of this discussion. Um, and if you can make it through this, then you can make it through the rest of the presentation. So we're going to talk about some vocab. So the first word um, is allele, which is a form of a gene. And a gene is a sequence of DNA that codes for something in particular. An example of that would be eye color. So we also have a genotype, which is a combination of alleles at a gene. So you have a gene which codes for something. There are alleles which are different forms of that gene. And a genotype is the combination of alleles that a particular individual, whether it be a human or an eagle, has at that location. So people and eagles and coyotes have two copies of each gene, which are, again, alleles, one inherited from their mother and one from their father. And these alleles can be the same, which is called homozygous or different heterozygous. And this is important to actually go into looking at matching individuals. So different, in, in, excuse me, different alleles have different size DNA fragments. So if we take DNA and then separate it out by size, um, you can tell individuals apart from another. So what I have on the screen here is an electropherogram. Um, that's the output that I would see again from the genetic analyzer. Um, this is a particular location in the genome that I've amplified. Um, and what it does is it creates peaks on the machine that you see when you run the sample. So across the bottom, uh, that is the size and base pairs. So the number of ACs, Ts, and Gs um, that make up that particular allele. And when you see the peaks on, in the green, um, those indicate how much of DNA there was at that particular size. So you'll notice how there's sort of uh, three peaks and then it drops off to nothing and then three peaks again. Um, what that is is just a type of mutation that we see called mutation stutter. I don't really have a time to explain it, um, but more or less if you just draw sort of like a larger blue um, peak over the entire thing, which I have there at the highest point, that's what you would call the genotype for that. So this individual here is a heterozygote. They have two different alleles at this particular gene. And the genotype that we would write down on our analysis sheet would be 104116, um, because they have those two different alleles and that's at that location that it was the largest amount of detection. So this is in direct comparison uh, to a homozygote. This would be on your analysis, you would only see one particular peak. And that just means that they have two copies of that same exact allele because um, they're just sort of overlapping on each other. So this individual's genotype would then be a 114-114. So I know that's a lot to sort of take in, uh, but now we're going to try and use it and uh, see what happens. So combining multiple loci, so multiple locations or genes that we're amplifying, you can create a DNA profile um, that would be then unique to the individual and allow you to tell individuals apart. So let's go ahead and try it out on the eagle samples and see if we can then charge the suspect with killing the dead eagles that uh, we found in the, the surf. Okay, so from our sampling here, we have uh, generated genotype profiles for uh, the arrow and then for three different eagle carcasses that we had found in the surf. So now what we wanna do is create our genotype profiles um, and like I had said previously, you want to look for the highest part of the peak, and that would be the actual genotype for that individual. So you'll notice that the arrow has three peaks, which is interesting because I had just said previously that you will find two alleles per individual. Sometimes it'll be two copies of the same one or two different ones. So what do we actually think we're seeing here? So go ahead and take a moment and think about it and uh, go ahead and type it in the chat box. Or Q and A box, I guess.
We have one response so far in the chat box. Um, the suggestion is that that's the genotypes of three different eagles. Well, that's a great suggestion, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Yep. And another so, said multiple individual eagles. Great. I'm glad that uh, you guys were able to see that. So what we see here is if we can finish off our other carcasses genotypes here, um, Eagle Carcass 1 has a 106-110 genotype. Eagle Carcass 2 has a 104-110. And Eagle Carcass 3 has a 114-114. So if we make a table out of our genotypes here, you'll notice that in the arrows genotype, it is a 104, 110, 114, but there is no 106 in there at all. So that sort of excludes Eagle Carcass 1 from matching that arrow. But Eagle Carcass 2 and 3 both have alleles that would be represented in uh, the arrows genotype. So at this point then, um, you know, do we have enough evidence to charge the suspect with killing an eagle? And why or why not? And we did in the chat before you asked that question, um, it was suggested that Eagle Carcass 2 and 3 are the ones that are on the arrow, which sounds like it lines right up with what you just said. Yep, no, that's exactly right. So at this point then, um, you could go ahead and charge the suspect. Um, so we have evidence that they were uh, hunting eagles and we also have evidence that they killed at least two eagles with that same arrow. Um, that other eagle, um, you know, could have, been there by natural chance or another arrow that they had could have been used to actually um, kill that individual. So because we had a mixed uh, blood and tissue sample on there, we were able to see that there were uh, two different genotypes in that same sample. So in reality, most cases you would do, um, the genotypes have about eight or so loci that you look at. Um, in humans, it's about 33. Um, and you need to have this many to deal with the, the math uh, that it takes to have uh, DNA profiles that won't match by random chance. Um, and this all goes down to what are called allele frequencies, uh, basically how common certain genotypes are in the population. Uh, so you'd have to do some population analyses beforehand, but based on how rare, how common things are, you can sort of calculate uh, the, the mathematical chance that a certain profile would be seen by random chance and not because it is actually the same uh, individual. All right, well, congratulations. You solved your first case. You figured out what species it was and uh, whether multiple parts match. Um, so at this point, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. If not, I can you know, share some other random case stories at this point. And feel free to put those questions in the Q&A box or in the chat and I can read them out loud for you. We got a question, how old are you? How old am I? I'm 32. And we got another question, do you deal with sharks? I have not, uh, but they definitely are a uh, species of importance. Um, especially when it comes to food. Um, there are certain cultures that really like having uh, shark fin soup. However, certain species of sharks are protected and others are not. And when all you have is a shark fin or a piece of a shark, it is very difficult to figure out what kind of shark it is. So doing that genetic analysis that I had shown you before, um, determining their species by DNA sequencing is really important uh, for that. Um, but it doesn't really help if you're out at like a wildlife market or something and trying to figure out quickly if someone's selling an illegal species. Um, so there are some people who are working on developing uh, fast tests that you could then use to determine whether or not a, a species of shark that's being sold is something that is illegal to sell. Um, so in the future, that might be something, you know, that we might look into here as well. Um, we have the question, was this a real case? Um, no, this one was not a real case, but it's very similar to real cases. Um, those uh, pictures I had shown of that bloody arrow were from a real case, um, but that was a, a deer hunting case uh, that I had done. So it's, it's um, a frequent sample that you have to deal with is uh, those kind of things. Sorry about that. Uh, what yep. is the craziest case you have done? <laughs> the craziest case? Um, hmm. 
Well, I think the craziest case I've done is very similar to what I just described where I had a sample of mixed uh, biological material. Um, trying to think about how to best preface the story. So there were a number of individuals who had been known in their local community to be poaching deer. Um, and the people in the community knew it was them, but they couldn't really prove it. So they eventually found a chance when they were uh, hunting deer and I think it was like June, June or July. Um, so way out of season. Um, and they were able to uh, call the game commission, which this was in Pennsylvania, um, out to the location. Um, and when they arrived, uh, they noticed there was at least five or six deer hanging in this uh, barn that these individuals had. Um, and they were all, um, you know, in a location where they would bleed into a, like a, a puddle on the floor, which sounds kind of gruesome, but that's what was happening. Um, and based on the, the puddle on the floor, the officers had figured that there were more deer that were actually uh, killed and bled into this puddle. So I was basically given a sample of blood scrapings off the floor of a bar and asked how many deer bled into that, that pile. Um, and it turned out being like 13 or 14. It was a rather high number. That's awful. Um... We have another question. How would you figure out who killed the animal if they'd used a gun rather than an arrow? Uh, well, thankfully guns are pretty messy. Um, if you find the spot where they actually shot the animal, you would find uh, blood on a tree or somewhere else um, at that point. Uh, but it is harder to connect that individual with that particular crime if they had used a gun. But with good enough you know, police work, you could still find that evidence. It's gonna be there. All right, um, next question is, what's the main species that you study? Uh, I would say for forensics cases, it's probably white-tailed deer. Um, they are a species of high value. Um, there's a lot of economic impact of, um, you know, hunting, especially in Maine where people from other locations will come to hunt the deer. Um, but as many laws as there are about how you can hunt and when you can hunt, um, you know, there will be people that will choose to hunt in ways that are illegal in order to gain an advantage um, in some way. Uh, so I would say that's probably the most common. Uh, after that, um, probably other game species uh, like turkeys, um, other types of birds, uh, at least in, in this area in particular, would be the most common that uh, would work on. Uh, we have the question in the Q&A. How many cases have you investigated? Um, I don't have an exact number, but somewhere between 50 and 75, I would say. Um, and a lot of them, like I had said, were about uh, deer hunting. And a lot of them were very uh, different in nature. And some of them are um, more related to food, like I had mentioned about the sharks. Um, in uh, Pennsylvania, where I had been doing this work before, uh, some... Uh, butchers will process deer that people hunt and I'm sure it happens uh, in Maine as well uh, but there's certain parts of the deer that are left over that those people don't actually want to pick up um, so less uh, you know ethical uh, butchers will take some of that deer meat and combine it with some beef that they have and then sell it as like a beef hamburger or something like that to sort of save some money um, but you know you can't sell it's illegal to sell food that's you know not what you say it is um, so we were able to actually test those meats to prove that there was deer meat in what they had said was actually beef. Um, and this is actually pretty common. Um, we, we got tipped off by uh, a person who's allergic to eating deer meat, but not beef. And they ate meat from a certain location and they, they got sick. And that's exactly what we want to avoid um, by having people eating things that isn't what, uh, you know, the person selling it says it is. All right, we have a few that I think I can put together. Um, we have, what's your job called? Do you like your job? And how long have you been doing this for? And how many cases would you say you've solved? Okay, uh, right now I'm a molecular diagnostic professional um, with Humane Extension. I've been in this job just over two years. At the current moment, I don't do wildlife forensics right now, um, but I would, in the future like to do that. Uh, UMaine's looking into it as a possibility. Uh, we definitely have the capability over here to do that. Um, like I had said before, my main job function right now is to test ticks for diseases, but I also do help with 
um, some plant, wildlife, and fisheries research as well. Um, and do I like my job? Yes, I very much like my job. Um, I would like to get outside a little more than I do, um, but we still get to do field work on occasion. Um, but a lot of the time it's spent working in a molecular laboratory. And I think, did I answer all those parts? You did. I was like, I figured that do you like it was probably going to be an easy one. Okay. Um, then we have the question, have you ever done any real cases before with equals? Um, I'm trying to think. I don't, I'm not sure that I have in particular. Um, and then what's the biggest animal that you've had a case on? I would say bears, definitely bears. Um, black bears, especially in certain locations when they feed off of uh, human garbage can, you know, be five or 600 pounds, just monster creatures. And I'm sure if, you know, if I was doing work in Maine at the moment, it would be moose, I would say. It looks like let's give folks a couple more minutes if anyone can think of any more questions they have about wildlife forensics or the other work that um, that Tom does, pop it right in the Q&A or the chat. I think what I'm going to say is take a moment and answer the question that no one asked and is how do you get into wildlife forensics? Um, because it's a pretty specialized field. Um, what I would say is, um, you know, take a number of biology uh, classes in high school. Um, when you finish, enroll in a four-year university and study uh, biology, uh, but you want to have experience with wildlife, but also with things like organic chemistry, chemistry and molecular biology. So it's kind of like uh, a background in multiple things, but also, you know, what I'm doing is only one particular aspect of wildlife forensics. You could be someone who's, you know, for instance, really interested in physics and firearms, and you could study, um, you know, projectiles and how different projectiles would impact different wildlife differently and solve crimes that way. It's not just DNA analysis. This is just a piece of the whole puzzle. You could be fascinated in wildlife disease and study, you know, being able to prove that certain people poisoned animals or something like that. Um, so by no means, it's not just, you know, limited to DNA analysis. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, when you're at university um, to sort of talk to, you know, your advisors and things like that and tell them what you're interested in doing and they'll sort of guide you um, in different ways. So don't be afraid to ask what else you can do or what more work you can do um, because they'll kind of rope you into these side projects that end up becoming your career, which you never even thought would happen, which happened with me with the uh, wildlife forensics. And we actually had two people almost simultaneously ask, what is the smallest animal you've ever done a case on? The smallest animal? Hmm. <sighs> Say probably turkeys, I would think. Um, like we had some stuff come in the lab that was uh, contail rabbits, but I don't, I didn't work on that particular case. Um, what is the rarest type of species that you've studied? Rarest. Um, hmm. Well, I would probably say where I was uh, located previously would be bobcats. Um, where I was working in Pennsylvania and uh, neighboring New Jersey, bobcats are on, uh, in New Jersey anyway, on the endangered species list there for the state. Um, there are only a few hundred individuals of them and I've actually done some population analysis for them in recent years that bridged off of the uh, bobcat research I did for my PhD in West Virginia. Oh, here's a good question, and I would also like to know this. What is your favorite animal? And that doesn't have uh, to just be in a forensic type okay. of way. I can answer that in a second without even thinking, and it. it's tigers. I don't know why. As a kid, I just love tigers because they're just, you know, big, muscular, beautiful creatures. Um, so I really like, you know, cats and the cat-dog debate. Um, but, you know, you can hold me negatively if you'd like if I'm answering cats instead of dogs. I know the panelists, a lot of them have cats. I've seen them in the, the video chats, so I can say that anyway. Um, but, you know, in terms of what's around here, now I'd probably say bobcats. I have a thing for cats, I guess. 
And I think that's about it for questions. I know that we, oh, it looks like we have one more that popped up and then I think that'll be it since we are, we are pretty close to ending time now. Um, do you know, uh, all right, here's a question. Do you know how many rabbits there you have to study? Or I guess probably how many rabbits came in because you had said that you did so that your lab did something with rabbits, but you didn't specifically. Uh, they weren't terribly common, um, but they are another species of uh, economic concern since they were a game species um, where I was. Uh, we also did study them for other reasons, though. Um, they harbor some diseases that can actually be spread to people from ticks, so it's kind of uh, connected all around. Um, and that's something that we actually test for right now in the lab. It's called tularemia. Um, and uh, the American dog tick will carry that, not the deer tick, the same one that uh, transmits Lyme disease. It's a different tick. And then, okay, we've got one last question and then that's, that's the, I swear this is the last one I'll be asking. What's <laughs> the most common animal that you have come in or have had come in for cases? Uh, I would, think deer, white-tailed deer, I would say. Well, this has been so great. All of our participants have had so many wonderful questions. We're so glad to see that you were, you had so many great questions about today's presentation. Um, I'm going to launch a quick survey if you um, would like to take that before we log off. Um, Thank you so much, Tom, and thank you to our participants for joining us today. Um, if you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope that you'll check out all that 4-H has to offer. Next week, we'll be learning about the science of gut microbes with Sue Ishak. That registration can be found, um, I believe- The link that I just put in the chat box. Great, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, that's right there in that link. Um, and if you, if, if you don't get to sign up for it right now, it's right there on our Learn From Home website as well. Um, if there are any Science Cafe topics that you would like to see us offer in the future, please feel free to let us know in the chat box. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Um, stay safe and we hope to see you here next week.